Welcome to College Prep Confidential, empowering your student with the elite tools they need to get accepted to their dream university. Discover test-taking blueprints from Ivy League professionals, financial aid secrets to get more money for school, and mindset tips for a better college future. Now, please welcome your host, Don Sevcik. Welcome to the CPC podcast, and this week is a first, finally, some of you have asked for it. We are actually interviewing somebody instead of me just giving you a quick dialogue and a story, and I'm excited for this episode because if you're in college or you're in the job market and you're kind of floating around figuring out what to do, this is going to be incredibly relevant to your struggle as well as things that could help you speed up getting through college and getting a good offer. So with that said, I want to give you the introduction and then we'll get started. Our guest this week is Rishav Kanal, and he's a best-selling author where at 21 years old, he convinced 11 universities to send his book to over 40,000 students across the U.S. Now he's the founder of Compound Career, where he helps college students, recent graduates, develop the career readiness skills to break into competitive job and internship programs from companies that have been ranked extremely high for overall employee happiness. He grew up in Kathmandu, Nepal, moved to the U.S. with his family in 2006, and he credits a lot of his success to his unique and difficult upbringing of growing up on food stamps. His alma mater, Virginia Tech, where he graduated as a business major, recently awarded him as Virginia Tech's most successful young alumni making him the youngest recipient of the award in Virginia Tech's history. He's already worked at companies like Under Armour and LinkedIn and now resides in the greater Chicago area where he plays a ton of tennis and drinks celery juice every morning. I love it. (laughs) So I like to welcome to the show, Rishav Kanal. Rishav, how's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah. Thanks for the addition with the celery juice. I don't know why. I've just been addicted to it. So it's been about seven months running every morning. I'll cut up celery, put it in the blender, put some water in it. And that's how I start my day. And it has been a life changer. (laughs) It's funny you mentioned that because I was just watching a couple high performers videos and, and, and sales and then entrepreneurship. And they both mentioned celery juice and greens. So I think there's a theme there that people listening should uh, latch on to and start doing. <laughs> That's I, I didn't even know about that. You know, it's funny. I like the reason for me why I started it really quickly. If, if any of your listeners are like, <laughs> why celery juice, you know, instead of coffee and whatnot. Uh, I, I remember the days like kind of waking up uh, where my gut was just like, I don't know, my stomach didn't feel great in the morning or something like that. And I would just wake up, feel sluggish and and now, like for the past, you know, a few months that I've started it on an empty stomach with the celery juice, like I just find myself incredibly alert, incredibly awake and looking forward to the morning instead of dreading it and eating waffles and sausages at like 630 in the morning, like I used to do in high school and whatnot. Isn't it amazing when you make one small tweak to the diet, how much it affects your outlook and your lifestyle? <laughs> and it's such a small thing too. <laughs> like it's not, you know, that, that, that's the funny thing my friends and I always talk about where a lot of the big advice and and people are like, Oh my gosh, how did you do this? And at the end of the day, sometimes it just comes down to eating better, sleeping better, getting more rest and just (laughs) doing the things that they preach to you, you know, since you were in school, starting like first grade from doctors and parents, eat your greens, eat your fruits, eat your veggies. And somehow it just turns you into a better person. Who would have thought? Yeah. It reminds me of the old saying, small hinges swing big doors. And I think celery juice and the greens is definitely a small hinge that can change people's lives. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I'm, I'm probably gonna have to steal that one from you. <laughs> All right. So we, we covered the, uh, the dietary secrets of a high performer. Let's get into it. So where did you go to college and what was your experience like there? Yeah. So college for me, Virginia Tech, and I was actually the first person in my family to attend a four-year undergrad college and really bask in the American college experience. Now, you know, keep in mind, you mentioned this in my bio where I moved to the U.S. from Nepal, but I've been in the States since 2006. College, I mean, that's a different beast in and of itself. I mean, fraternities, sororities, tailgates, intramurals, dorm life, like I knew nothing. And the only thing that I knew was like, okay, go to class and a professor is going to be there and they're going to teach you something. Everything else was like still incredibly foreign. And that feeling of, oh man, 
I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what's going on. I think that dread started to really change towards the end of my freshman year when I joined a business organization and found a really good, amazing community. Um, in that community, that's where I found my friends, mentors, people that I consider family, and, and those people even after we graduated uh, to date have already attended like two wedding events. There's more already on the way. So I think finding that community really changed me as a person and made me experience Virginia Tech to be incredibly memorable. Probably one of the more amazing life experiences where it started out a little bit rocky, right? The transition was a little bit difficult, but towards the end, definitely, definitely something I'm super thankful for. And I love this because you make it through growing up on food stamps. You make it through Virginia Tech after everything you went through. Tell us about the transition. So you graduate Virginia Tech and now you're in your, your working career. You've got a solid resume working at places like LinkedIn. So tell us about things you learned and, and any struggles you had uh, as you enter the workforce. Yeah, so we'd love to first like share, I guess, a little bit of the, the high snapshots that people tend to see. And then I'll back into some of the, the struggles. And, you know, you mentioned being 21 and publishing the books. I'm 24 now. And after going through a really tough battle with COVID that like sent me to the ER, endless doctor visits and like small hinges, all that good stuff, celery juice, that's how all that came to be. But I'm starting to feel more and more thankful for all the things that I have accomplished over the past few years. And a couple of the things that I'm incredibly grateful for, number one, being extended a job offer from LinkedIn, even before I, before I graduated. And I remember the dean from my business school, him and I having a quick conversation. And I was never the best at school, by the way. I think I barely graduated with like a 3.0 GPA. And I had to withdraw from one of the classes. I believe it was like intro to uh, Shakespeare <laughs> that I didn't do the best at because back then I wasn't the best at managing my time, which we'll kind of get to. But Got into LinkedIn. At that point, I started advising almost like these big, large Fortune 100 companies on their hiring practices. And then as I was doing that, I got an email from Virginia Tech saying, hey, Rashad, remember us? We've been keeping in touch with what you've been doing, and we've been hearing how often you're giving back to our student body community. So we'd love to award you as our most recent successful young alumni. And that was in 2019, right before COVID. And even before that, this was with like Under Armour, had a chance to meet the CEO and then the book, podcast. And everybody, I think, sees like the snapshot and it's like, wow, Rashab's always been great. <laughs> and whenever I hear that, I always think of, if you can remember like the classic iceberg posters that probably almost 99% of elementary school teachers have in their classroom where people only really see the tip of the iceberg and then there's this huge block of ice submerge underwater. The reason I kind of share all those things is like, I really didn't get here without hardship. You know, I, I moved to this country in 2006. At that time, I had a very thick, heavy accent, buck teeth. We couldn't afford braces, which kind of meant I was the prime target for a lot of the schoolyard bullies. Um, I received free and reduced lunch, lived in a one bedroom apartment with my parents. I was like infested with cockroaches. And I, I wish I could say it got easier, but after high school, that's when things got worse, even from like 2014 to 2016, because a lot of those things were incredibly self-inflicted. Now that I was in college living kind of, you know, more or less on my own and very independent than my parents with people that I'm extremely close with. And the first two years, the reason why it was so difficult is because I think all the unhealthy habits that I had suppressed started to rear its ugly head. And when you mix in small things like the drinking culture and alcohol, like it wasn't like I needed to be put in a facility or anything, but like every weekend doing that, it was just shining a really bad, nasty spotlight on them. And I think rock bottom finally hit when I remember right after I graduated a couple months, Don, not too far from you, downtown Chicago's office, that's where LinkedIn's headquarters is. I remember crying in my office because of persistent panic attacks. And I think all the bad habits have just like finally bubbled up. And I, I wish I could tell you it didn't suck, but it did. But now I fondly look back at everything and I'm just like, I learned so much from that experience. Uh, and, and sports had always been a big part of my life growing up. There's this weird phenomenon in sports where oftentimes 
very average athletes tend to make like the best coaches. <laughs> um, and, and I started to think about like why that is. And at least my definition or, or my guess as to why that it is because all these average coaches, they have to learn how to build all these skills to compete with the people that are more naturally gifted and more physically equipped. And I think the reason why I think I've been able to have a lot of success, not only in my career, but also in the company that I'm building now is that all those scars have really allowed me to understand everything I know in order to compete with the best. And those lessons have allowed me to be a better person, a better friend, a better coach, and just be incredibly empathetic to other people who've still yet to realize that potential because I've been there, I was them, um, and I can understand kind of the journey and, and where their head is at. So yeah, if you're listening to this and, and if you can relate with some of it, I, I would just hope for you to consider and pause whether you're a parent or a student. Like, you know, sometimes it's like we fail to zoom out <laughs> And, and think about life in a really big horizon versus thinking, oh my gosh, I've always struggled. I'm always going to struggle. This is my identity. And I thought that for a long time, but it wasn't until a couple of people pulled me out of that. And I got to pull myself out of that, that I realized it's like, man, a couple of right decisions can really change where you go. Um, so you'd asked about career. Obviously you've got the highlights, the snapshot, but the context is really necessary, Don, like you said, of understanding the hardships and the struggles that I came from. Yeah, it, it wasn't easy by any means. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up panic attacks and kind of hitting a bottom for you because I, I noticed a lot of people that eventually accelerate above the average person in business or careers has not only hit a point like you described, but there's a there's a there's a clarity moment. First there's sadness or anger, but then there's almost a clarity, like what am I doing? Or how did it get this way? Or or just there, there needs to be a change. And when you mentioned the panic attacks and then just everything you went through, did that help you almost sharpen your focus and reevaluate some of the choices you were making? Because I love the saying, iron sharpens iron. And it's almost like some of those situations almost make us better if we get through them and get clarity of thought. Did going through that help you sharpen your focus? A thousand percent. I gained so much perspective. I mean, here I am at 23, 24 years old, questioning my life, mortality, <laughs> like things that I'm like, wait, hang on, should a 20 year old really be thinking about stuff like this, right? You hear it from others. It's like, oh, you're too young to think about stuff like that. But going through the hardships, I think with COVID and not really understanding how to take care of myself outside of just needing to always be the best in business or in career. I mean, we see this, you know, not that I'm at their level at all whatsoever, but with really top athletes, I mean, the Olympics was a big one, right? Where they got to the height of the game, but at a certain point, you got to realize like how to take care of yourself first and your body and everything. And until like when, when it all crumbles, like that's when you gain the most amount of perspective, at least for me personally. So spot on, it's, it's, it's awesome that you call that out by the way, because yeah, it wasn't until I, reach my breaking point that I realized, well, hang on, there are other aspects to this world that I need to consider and health as wealth. And that's been the biggest kind of learning moment that I would say I've had for the past year and a half. Yeah, that's a great insight. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, your story when Tim Grover's talking about training Michael Jordan and some of the elite NBA athletes. And he says, people like to think of me as a trainer, but as a trainer, you come in, you do some stretches and maybe a light workout. When you come to me, I'm going to have you running until you're puking in a bucket and wishing you never made this decision. But when you come out the back end, you're going to be stronger and more sharp than you ever could have been on your own. So it seems like that's kind of what you went through. Yeah. And, and, and still grateful. And I think I'm fortunate to have friends and even go through this journey of self-awareness where I'm like, had it not been for those experiences, I don't know if I would have changed my habits, right? I remember my diet uh, sophomore year at Virginia Tech. You'll probably laugh at this. I was known for making my specialty, which is 99 cent pasta and cutting up $1.99 hot dogs and putting it in a stir fry and almost eating that religiously. So small things like that, where I look back and I'm like, how did I not explode because of what I was putting in my gut 
But again, would not have changed it because I didn't understand the consequences of what I was doing because, you know, you're like you're young, your body can adapt to so many things. But when you get out of that environment, it adjusts pretty fast and reality tends to hit you in the face. So, yeah, it's a scary guy, Tim Grover. I, I remember, I don't know if you knew this story, but uh, something about how he and Michael Jordan, a little bit of a side note, but I remember this. I thought you'd get a crack out of it where he had sent, in order to get Michael Jordan, I think he had sent letters to every single Chicago Bulls basketball player, except for Michael. And when Michael was like, wait, hang on, why didn't I get one? I think that's how him and Tim started that relationship of Tim being Michael's like personal trainer and taking his game to the next level. I heard about it in a podcast and I thought that was kind of, kind of unique because Tim's an intense guy. Like he'll put you through the ringer and that's only from the stories I hear from, from what he tells about back in the Chicago days. Yeah. I just finished the unstoppable book for the, probably the fifth time on audio. So it, it I learned something new each time and it, and I remember reading that story and it, it never gets old. It almost gets better each time you read it. So so I, 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 I'm curious, and I, and I wonder what your listeners would do. And I don't know if this is a generational thing. So I'd love some insights here really quickly. For me, I, I, my friends make fun of me all the time because when it comes to YouTube videos and podcasts and audiobooks, I binge them almost as much as I can. But almost all of them, I have to double the speed. So I listen to everything on 2X. <laughs> I don't know if you're the same when it comes to audiobooks. I don't know how you consume your content, but people think I'm crazy and I'm nuts because I can't, I don't know, I can't do the whole normal thing anymore. It just sounds too slow for my ears. Yeah, it, it depends on the book. I mean, the really good ones, maybe the first time through I'll do 2X, but then when it's second and third and fourth listening, I'll slow it down because there's deep wisdom. But I'll tell you what, when I get those mediocre books that are hyped and then you get to the second chapter and you're like, really, this was 400 ratings of five stars. I start turning <laughs> up to 2.5. Like, let's just get through this and give me the uh, quick summary. Yep. Yeah. So many of those where it's like packaged a little bit differently, but it's the same stuff all over again. Yeah. Trust me. I, I've gone down that journey way too many times so I can relate. That's funny. So I want to, so you've talked about the struggle. You've talked about college. Now I want to, I want to move up uh, with your timeline, because I think this is a great part of your story that can help our listeners. So you leave corporate America to start your own business. Can you tell us more about that decision, more about the company and why you decided to go off on your own? Yeah. Um, it was probably one of the hardest decisions like I've had to make. I mean, I like it, it's, it's very non-traditional in the sense that I really loved my job, right? And I think it's a very like, you know, we often hear of stories where it's like, man, I, I was working and I hated what I was doing and, and that hate and the problem came up and that ultimately allowed me to leave and it was a perfect timing or I might've gotten laid off, like all these things. But I recognize I was in a, such a unique place. Like I was like, man, like I am somehow very lucky where the work I was doing was great. The benefits were awesome. I mean, don't like, in the Chicago office, they were feeding us breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So for two years, I didn't go grocery shopping. <laughs> like that's a, that was a very crazy thing to come up with because I was almost, you know, it felt like summer camp every day going into work. Like I had an amazing manager and like all the complaints that I heard from my friends about work, I realized companies like LinkedIn, companies that are in that upper echelon, in order for them to compete with other companies, they do a really good job in creating an environment where all those things don't really exist because they want you to stay as long as possible, right? So you might be wondering, and maybe your listeners too, so it's like, Rashav, if you had it so great, why did you leave? <laughs> Sounds like utopia. Why would anybody leave? And, and trust me, I wrestled with that decision for a long time. But for me, there was this part where this problem of seeing my friends go down two paths kept coming up over and over again, where I had one group of friends where they got into the process of career hunting and trying to find jobs and opportunities. And for whatever reason, they just couldn't crack that egg. They just couldn't package their experiences and their skills and, and communicate and network and, and implement a lot of these things into practice. So what happened was that the peers that I was in class with who, you know, I would talk about changing the world and having all these aspirations, unfortunately, like 
had to go back, move back home. Nothing wrong with moving back home, saves you a ton of money, but they just regressed back. Like all their aspirations, it's, it, it's almost as if somebody really burst their bubble and their ceiling of what they wanted their life to be. They just immediately brought it down and they were like, hmm, maybe this is it for me. And then I had another group of friends where they knew the job hunting process was going to be difficult and felt like the job that they had, they were lucky to stumble in it. So even though they hated the job that they were doing, right, like finding no joy in what they were doing, they didn't want to leave. So it just got into the cycle of, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm okay for now. And I remember having conversations whenever I would go back to to my like hometown, see my friends and family, this is the DC area for me. I remember having to almost like lie to my friends <laughs> because you never want to like, I, I don't know if, if your listeners can relate or maybe you can too, where maybe sometimes things in your life might've just worked out and, and people are getting together and everybody kind of goes around, shares what's happening. And it's almost this conversation around like, hey, this is tough, this is difficult. Well, you don't want to be the person that sticks out like a sore thumb and saying, hey, I don't have any of the problems you do. Ta-da, look at me. Like I, I never wanted to be that person because I, I understood where their hardships were coming from. And when I went back to LinkedIn, the first few months after my quote unquote day job was over, just naturally I found myself from about 5.30 to close to 11, still staying at the office at LinkedIn. And the only reason for that is because my friends had set up calls with me to ask and to almost gain advice of Rishabh, how can I do what you did? And I was just like naturally doing that. And then that evolved to me then saying no to hanging out with a couple of my friends in Chicago. And they were like, hey, Friday night, Saturday night, let's go out. And I was like, that sounds a lot of fun, but I think what I'm gonna do is actually stay in the LinkedIn office, use their whiteboard and design a whole curriculum because I've just decided that I'm going to mentor like these five Virginia Tech students for free and like they'll learn and, and I'll change their life. And I don't know why I did it. I, I genuinely don't. And, and I've tried to answer that question because at that point in time, there was no like business plan. There was no this. I genuinely was doing it. And the more and more I did it, I was like, whoa, like the impact that I can make here is amazing because the students that I was you know, quote unquote, working with, not really because I was just doing it out of my own will, they were getting jobs at Microsoft, at Amazon. They were calling me saying, hey, you changed my life. Like, I was like, are you serious? Like, I thought everybody knew this. And then I had my own mentors at LinkedIn telling me, Rashad, what are you doing here? <laughs> and that was like, that was a cool part. Like, even they were questioning, Rashad, what are you doing here? Like, you're fine here. But I don't know if you're an A player that needs to be here or go elsewhere and do this thing. Because there's some special sauce that you've got here that is going to allow you to really change a lot of people's lives. Go after it. And at that point, you know, this was right around August of last year. And, and I saw this problem getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I said, you know what? I, I think the time's finally right. So decided to leave. I know that was a very long winded answer, but I thought the context was necessary since it's not incredibly traditional where, you know, we, we hear a lot of stories of, man, I hated my job. Like it forced me out. I got fired. I recognized how grateful I was. I just, the problem was way too big for me to not do anything about it. Yeah. You just touched on a very important point for our listeners, actually two or three of them. The first is you're, you're at a great job with great benefits, but still something's pulling you to stay after and start working on the side hustle. And, and I think there's a lot of people in this country and around the world that either want to do that or are kind of doing that, but don't feel like they have support. And so when, when you tell that story, that's important because people will feel more like they almost feel sometimes like alienated. Like I'm at my job, I should be happy, but I'm not, or maybe there's something I could do better. And so when you tell that story, it's powerful because it almost gives permission and it gives understanding to other people who want to do it or are doing it. And then you talked about another fascinating point, which I can't tell you how many times we've had this discussion at the dinner table or when we're out just talking to people is this, this almost notion of success, jealousy or success, shame. Mm. And, and I always wondered about this back in the day. And, and one of the best quotes I ever heard was, people can forgive a lot of things except success. And so when you talk about kind of trying to hide it or not, not focus so much on how well your life's going, it, it's, it's fascinating because 
I think top performers see that a lot. And so they almost have to wear a mask or almost veil what's really going on in their life. And I mean, I used to work with somebody who was a top performer and, and I remember talking to him and he's like, Don, you don't understand. He's like, when you're, when people ask me what I did on, on my vacation time, I have to lie. I can't tell them that, Hey, not only am I doing good at my job, I have a side business and investments and I can travel all over the world, but I can't tell them that because it's going to alienate me from the people who just work their job and, you know, they have an average salary and they don't have any more desire or willpower to do things. So it's almost a juggling act. And, and you covered that really well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something I, I've wrestled with because I, again, like having that perspective of growing up without very little and, and, and there are always levels to this, right. Which I'm sure your friend can attest to and probably you yourself as well. Like where I look at others and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have a long way to go. Like I know nothing. <laughs> to me, I sit back and laugh. I'm like, how scratch my head? Like, how did I get here? And I still do. But yeah, it's just something I, I've always wrestled with because I never want to be the person ever in a room where I'm very tone deaf to whatever is going on. And if other people are feeling the hardship, I, I want to understand that context. I want to go deeper into that instead of having to feel like, oh, once you, you're done speaking, let me add my own thing. And we just go back and forth. Like, that's not a conversation. That's two people talking at one another. Um, and it's something I, I, I don't know, maybe it was my mom, maybe it was my parents, maybe it was my upbringing that taught me this, but something I've always felt very, 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 very cognizant about to never, never do um, in a group setting. Yeah. And that's, I think, an important social skill that has fallen off for certain people is it's almost like a ping pong match of, I went on vacation. Well, I went on vacation here. And then <laughs> I have these friends. Well, I have these friends here instead of empathizing and, and finding common ground to talk about with the other person. That's, that's so well put. I like that. I really like that visual. You're so right. I mean, and, and who knows where that stems from. And, and I think, you know, probably a lot of it, right. You will hear the classic like attribution to, to social media because you're always trying to kind of one up your friends in terms of the number of likes and, and you're sort of battling for that validation. Yeah. And I, and I hope we can start to create more empathy where when a friend asks or says, Hey, I went on vacation people's natural response isn't, oh, I went so-and-so this place. It's instead, wow, it sounds like you had a blast. What was your favorite part? <laughs> and, and getting them to tell you a little bit more about it. And I, and I just feel like, yeah, the relationships I've made by doing that, I, you know, I, I, I've got a small core group of friends for life because of it. And it's such small, easy things to, to implement. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because if you're in a room of let's just say 10 people and somebody's talking and they talk about a really fantastic vacation or they got a new car and not for bragging just because they were asked, I, I tend to find that six or seven people are instantly going to get upset and mm -hmm. one or two will be like, oh, that's great. But then one or two will be what you just said is, oh, wow, tell me more about that. How did you do that? They Not only are they celebrating it, they want to learn how to do something like that, how to, how to get that car or get that vacation or just generally interested in how that vacation went. Yeah. There's a, something I I've tried to pride myself on is whenever friends will share like good news on social media or, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, what have you, maybe they got engaged, maybe they just got a new job or maybe something small happened, but we want to celebrate anyway. I almost always never send them a text. Instead, I'm one of those weirdos. People listening might be like, why, why is he doing this? But I, I don't know. I, I find it so enriching where I'll send them a voice note. Um, so instead of letting text dilute my message saying, oh, congrats, you know, because I don't know how they're going to perceive that message. I'm going to send them a voice note for about 30 seconds, just congratulating them. Be like, oh my gosh, I know you've been working really hard or Hey, like, I didn't even know you were doing that. That's amazing. Like, tell me more. You must be so hyped. And I, I've just rekindled actually a lot of relationships doing that too, caring about what people care about. And yeah, I, again, I don't know where it stems from. I've tried to figure that out. Maybe it's my mom, maybe it's my dad. I don't know, but kudos to whoever, because <laughs> it has served me pretty well in life. You just give a great tip, which I hope all our listeners caught. And if not, I'm going to put it in the show notes with everybody emailing and texting. If you take another route, say voicemail or a call or even even a physical 
greeting card, a congratulations, you're going to stand out a hundred times more than the rest of the people that are going the traditional digital route. So I hope everybody listening caught that because it's going to help you explode your network and get attention that other people couldn't because they're just texting or sending an email. So I want to thank you for sharing that because that's a very important point for networking. Yeah, there, there's been, you know, actually one of my best friends, I consider him a brother. It's his birthday today by the time we're recording this and something that he impressed upon me. And this is something that we started doing um, when we had our podcast and, and, and we were working together. And this was something people absolutely loved. So towards the end of every year, we would sit down and compile a list of all the people that in some way, shape or form impacted our lives. And the list over time grew from like 50 to 70 to 80. We did it for about three years and absolutely loved it. Um, the reason we stopped is because like, it just like, it, we ended up going separate ways um, and we're still best friends till the end of the day, but like, it was just like logistically so hard to manage. But when we did it, it was amazing is we would record ourselves for about a minute, thanking each, each of those individuals and then scheduling the emails to arrive the day after new year's, just putting a face to, how much of an impact they made in our lives and and people still to this day i remember the the past president of the phoenix suns when i met him because he's a virginia tech alumni and when they were handing me the award the most amazing moment and i'm so glad my mom was there with me we were having a conversation and here comes this amazing successful executive and the first thing he says like you know what your son did and i still remember till this day and I think it just, I don't know, I think it, it, it made her feel really good. And I got to see that because then she was like, wow, like, at least I taught him something, right? <laughs> like, he's an, he's an awful cook. You know what? I, I wish I could have taught him that, but at least I taught him some of these things. And, and, and that was something, I don't know, I, I've let that moment, like, push me forward to kind of remind myself, like, hey, text, emails, nothing but dots on a screen, like, do something else, because people need to feel that nowadays more than ever. Yeah, it's a good habit to build. And after you do it for a couple of times, it almost becomes automatic. So that's, that's a very good tip for our audience. Yeah. Now, earlier you covered the third point, which I'm so glad you covered because I, I hear this all the time, both on LinkedIn and then networking groups and mastermind groups. So the big frustration, and I'm sure you've heard this is the job interview process and not just with people who have a job and are looking or get laid off in the market, but people coming out of college because it's almost it's almost like getting dumped, uh, cold water dumped over their head because <laughs> they go into the interview process like, okay, I have this degree at Virginia Tech, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm ambitious. I should just go on a couple interviews and it should be bang, bang, bang. And unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. So big thing I've been hearing about is interviews and the job interview process and getting a good career. So I want to ask you, how does your company, Compound Career, help people land a job or internship out of college? Yeah. Again, I like all these like quotes and vivid imagery that you're giving me. I, the cold water dumped on the head is exactly right from all the all the students that I speak with. And really, I think in, in terms of the, the structure of Compound Career, right, and, and how we work. So internally within our students, we tend to call it a fellowship. And there's a podcast that I listened to by you, actually. Um, I don't know if it was the most recent one, and hopefully some of the listeners tuning in, we'll go ahead and binge on that one next, where you talked about how really successful people, in order to shortcut their path to success, they come up with these like mental models and frameworks, and they go, you know, a step beyond and say, well, hasn't there already been a roadmap laid out by somebody else? Like, could I go connect with them or meet with them, learn from them so that I avoid all the mistakes that they did? So for us in the fellowship, it's actually based on three big models or like frameworks, right? So for anyone, I would say that has seen young professionals on LinkedIn totally crush it, or maybe a successful family friend where you're like, wow, like how did they get that job coming right out of school? Those individuals, when you boil it down, have always followed these three pillars and they are models, network, and accountability. And when you have any of those pillars missing, the result of having that successful career, let alone getting a job or an internship, either won't be attainable or it's not going to last very long. So I'll quickly like touch on what each of those uh, models, network and accountability, what each of those pillars really mean. So I talk to students 
And when I talk to them and I hear the challenges that they're sharing with me, almost always their strategies are lacking in one or the other. For example, I'll hear a lot of students tell me, Rishav, I've spent hours looking up how to write the perfect resume, reading so many blogs, Googling it, doing things on my own. And the perspective that I always share with them is like, that's awesome that you're doing that. But the challenge is you have to understand how that information is relevant for your industry. And most often that comes from networking because we know it's really about who you know versus what you know. So at the end of the day, when everybody else is doing the same thing, how are you going to stand out? And even when people network, the challenge is they don't really understand how to model certain messages that actually get people to respond or how to keep a systematized process so that you're sending follow-ups without being a pest. All these things, again, when students tell me they're struggling with job hunting, one of those pillars is almost always missing. So for us, this is why our fellowship works so well is because it's got components of all three. And when you have all three, the models, the network, and the accountability, the results of getting that job you want is 100% guaranteed. And in fact, we're so confident right, in our process because we've seen it work over and over and over again is that our six-week career coaching program, it guarantees parents that their child will get their ideal job or internship in their dream industry. And to eliminate any risk for that parents because we're so confident if they're worried well, Rashad, you got this program. Is it really going to work for my child? We always tell them, look, if your child doesn't get that ideal job within six weeks, we will work with them on a one-on-one -on -one, unlimited basis at no additional cost until they're hired. So when we think about models, when we think about network, when we think about accountability, when one of those pillars are missing, but we've got all three really quickly within the fellowship, what does that actually look like? So for models, when it comes to us and our program, the key is for us to be able to take a candidate coming out of school or that's currently still in school, that is a tier three candidate to a tier one candidate. And you probably have heard of the saying, if you want to go somewhere, the quickest way is to ask the people who've already been there. Refer referencing back to um, that podcast that you did about models and, and successful people, how they think about the path that has already been laid. So really for the first few days, they are focused on a couple of things for us. Number one, we design a quick 30-day action plan that is customized to each and every single fellow because everybody's got different lives, different schedules. When do they do work? When do they do all that? So we sit down, we craft out that schedule for them. After that, then it's very easy to then strategically think about, okay, A, what do you want to do? But then after that, what type of companies do we want to target? It's crazy the amount of times we hear from students, I'm just going to go on LinkedIn and apply and send my resume to over 200 companies without really evaluating, I'm going to spend a lot of time at this company. Let me be a little bit more strategic. And once we know kind of the direction, then we actually work with them, rewrite their resume with them from scratch on top of rebuilding their um, LinkedIn. And because they've got the models, we can do that in like less than five working days. In fact, one of our uh, students, Calvin, he recently, actually today when we're recording this, just got off an interview with Nestle and he told me he had applied to Nestle three times and always got rejected. And this was uh, an opportunity that he sourced, but on top of that in the same week or a couple of weeks before he had a recruiter from Red Bull reach out to him all because he made a couple of changes on his LinkedIn because of me having worked there, I was able to kind of teach him, okay, here are some insider things that most people don't know in terms of how to optimize your profile, show, you, show up for the right keywords. And then when it comes to networking, which is like 90% of the battle, the key here is for us to develop a great strategy on, okay, what type of influencers do they need to reach out to? How do they need to utilize LinkedIn to do that? How do they need to utilize cold email to do that? So majority of the individuals actually use both cold email and LinkedIn, and we teach them how to do that to generate conversations. And then on top of that, we also have mock conversations with them so that they know how to engage in a back and forth dialogue. We talked about empathy a little bit ago of knowing what type of questions to ask to make people feel really good. That's where we've seen fellows go from being really bad at communicating to almost skyrocketing their success because they understand how to do the song and dance. And then the last part is really the accountability because we've seen that 
you know, even if we get people the best plans, if they don't follow it, there's no point. And for us, accountability takes shape in two forms. One, the traditional sense where um, I actually check up on our students every day of the week. Our students give me feedback at the end of the day, what they were working on. So for other programs that take months for them to get the job, we've got folks that started with us maybe four or five weeks later are already through the final round stages and are evaluating multiple offers because we work really fast. And then on top of that is the strategic accountability. I hear this all the time from students and some of your listeners or maybe some parents that are listening, your child might want a marketing degree. And this is the best example. But nowadays companies are looking for very specific skills and universities. The gap right now is that those universities are very far behind in giving your child the skills that they need that will make them employable. So this is where we actually, if a student needs it, we will pair them up. We will help them find a nonprofit that needs help in a certain area. So bringing it back to marketing in that example, if somebody wants to break into marketing and that is the job that they want, in order for them to gain the Facebook ad experience, the Google SEO experience, maybe the content experience that they need, we'll actually pair them up with a nonprofit who needs help in those areas and then teach them how to show up as a great project manager. Because Don, as you know, it's all about managing expectations at the front, asking the client the right questions in order to deliver the best outcome where everybody's happy. And then they can package that experience so that when they're interviewing at companies like Microsoft, LinkedIn, Google, they have a resume that is so different from everybody else that's applying. So that's in a nutshell, how the career development fellowship works, where it's got the models, the network, the accountability. And I always like to say, it's almost like a personal training session, right? But for your career, where just like a nutritionist would go out of their way to make it super easy for a world-class athlete to get in the best shape possible. I'm doing that for the students that I work with to help them break into competitive companies that are ranked really high for overall employee happiness and companies that are statistically harder to get into than Harvard. So this is almost like the interview Olympics from what you've described, because you're covering and you touched on a, very important point of the chicken and the egg syndrome and the job interview process for people in college. So not only have you covered interviews and paid jobs, you're also helping people if they don't have the experience to go get some experience with a nonprofit, package that up and then come back and get a job with a for-profit company, which is incredible because the chicken and the egg problem is real along with the job interview problems that people have either getting the interview or getting through the interview. So I love this offer. And I also love it because there's, there's three parts. It's almost like a triangle. And and like you said, if one piece isn't there, the other two tip over. Yep. So the networking, by the way, is powerful because I don't think a lot of people realize, and, and I'm sure you've seen the stat. If you just apply to a job or tell somebody you're, you're, you're good or you're great at your job, you may get through to like one half of 1%, but if somebody is a referral for you at a job or, or a sale, what is, what is the stat? Like 26 times more, more likely to go through or get past the next level because you have a referral. Well, and, and that's so funny you mentioned that because on the other side, and this isn't something I knew until I started at LinkedIn is people almost always ask, it's like, well, how do I get that referral? And, and like all these, well, it comes from networking. Yes, but what people also don't consider is that employees at these companies are also incentivized through referrals. So to give you an example, at LinkedIn, uh, there was a the colleague of mine that I worked with, and I would hear rumblings about him, who almost made, I think in one year, uh, an additional like fifty or $60,000 just from the number of referrals that he like distributed, because he would like connect with individuals and if they were a good fit. Because if you think about it from the company's perspective, it's really expensive for them to make a bad hire. So if a company is like, hey, if you can vouch for somebody, if you know the work that they've done, that's why referrals kind of stand out in that process because a lot of that validation and that vetting has already been done by the current employee and they just kind of get short-circuited. And then the second thing too, and and these are the wins for us are are like the main thing that keeps me going even for the days that that are hard, right? Because, you know, building a business, as you know, like any business is gonna be super difficult and, We just had Christian, who's a fellow that I recently worked with, graduated from East Carolina University. And the only experience that he had on his resume was that he was a cashier and he'd worked for Jimmy John's. And 
graduated with a barely a 2.9 or a 3.0 GPA, something like that. But because of his ability to network and utilize cold email, uh, right before, I want to say maybe Labor Day, all of this happened within like five days. But right before Labor Day, he shoots a very personalized cold email, attaches a cover letter video expressing his interest to the Herchevec group. Now, for those that watch Shark Tank, that is the same Robert Herchevec who has this very prominent cybersecurity company that is blowing up right now. And the VP of sales actually gets back to Christian maybe an hour later saying, hey, Christian, let's go ahead and set up an interview. Uh, Christian sets up the interview uh, with the manager that manages all the, the entry-level hires for this company. And then a couple of days later, he got a text from that manager saying, hey, Christian, Robert, meaning Robert Herchevec, asked me if you've signed your offer letter yet. He's super excited for you to be joining the team. And he saw your video. We're all happy to have you. And he got the job without even needing to submit a resume. And I sit there and I'm like, as long as you package yourself differently, I mean, the world, the world really is your oyster if you just learn how to ask for it the right way. It's powerful because a lot of people in the job market are afraid of rejection. And what they don't get is they, they worry about the downside, right? Of what am I going to lose? Am I going to lose face? Am I going to be ashamed? I, I can't handle no. And what the right question they should be asking is what you just covered is, but what's the upside? Because if you look at the best investors in the world, the venture capitalists and, and people who take risks, they, they get rejected a lot, but they play in a game where there's a huge upside and a limited downside. So speaking in terms of money, they may put $1,000 down, which is not much for them, but what's the upside on, on the trade or, or, the, or the opportunity if, if the other side pays off or says yes? It's 100 or 200 times that. So for somebody like you said, working at Jimmy John's, may, maybe making 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour, and then they get a job with a Hershevec group, and you don't have to tell me the salary, but cybersecurity pays well. You're looking at a, a 10, 15, 20, 25 X upside just for having the courage to reach out or, or as we talked about earlier, taking a different approach than most candidates do. And I think the big lesson from what you just said is ask yourself what the upside is. Instead of worrying about rejection or, or, or what you know being ashamed, ask yourself what could happen if they say yes. Yeah, I mean that's I love that summary right there. Exactly. What would ha or what could happen if they say yes? And and this again goes back to the three pillars and how you brought up, you know, it's almost like a triangle, right? Like without one side, the other two are going to be tipping over. Where, you know, I'll have students that tell me it's like, hey, I've tried emailing or reaching out like this, but then I they get to the interview and they don't know how to package themselves. Like keep in mind, Christian still had to understand, okay, he got the yes. So how is he going to leverage that yes into crushing the interview? And then he had, I believe, two or three rounds. Like it was pretty competitive. And then after that, three rounds of interviews, understood how to communicate his value well and translate his experience at Jimmy John's to how it's going to translate into cybersecurity. And as long as you can make the distinct connection, people will see it, they'll believe it. And it's not like, you know, he was lying. He just understood what does this company need? What are my skills? How do I align the two together? And most people, I think, just fail to, to make that gap. And yeah, cybersecurity pays really well. <laughs> uh, in fact, I had a conversation with him a couple of days ago where him and his girlfriend are actually going to be looking at condos. And that was something he, he said he never thought he would be doing at his age, where he's like, Rashad, when all my friends are kind of just working these jobs and living apartments and kind of just burning money, like I have the opportunity now to speak with realtors and build assets. So he's like, you've changed my life. And it almost like it was close to the point of bringing me tears. Cause I mean, trust me, the days are hard, but hearing, you know, stories like that from Christian, it, it, it all makes it worth it. Powerful, powerful testimonial. I, I love it. I love stories like that, that people take a risk and, and they take a different route than they usually do. And, and look at the huge payoff. I mean, going from Jimmy John's to a job with Hershevec from Shark Tank. It's just, I, I love it. So I, I also, I, I can't end this episode without taking advantage of your skill set. So you've been nice enough to give a special offer to our audience. And I know a lot of them are going to need that. So could you tell us more about that offer? Yeah. Um, and I just want to preface, like, I love working with families that are already listening to podcasts like yours, because for me, that shows that 
they really care about investing in themselves and their child and, and really for your audience, you know, if they qualify, if it's a great fit and we can work out the details and put it in the show notes where you can access it, clicking the link and whatnot. But uh, there are a couple of things that I, that I want to provide exclusively to your audience. Number one, I will personally sit down with you and your college age child over zoom and audit their resume and LinkedIn for 30 minutes. There's so many career coaches out there who charge for stuff like that, but I'll personally sit down with you and do it for free. Um, on top of that, right after the call, I'll go ahead and send you a copy of my free, free book that you can give to your child. And to make it even sweeter, um, I'll even give $250 off my services when you tell me that you found me from this podcast. And there will be a link where you can include like the promo code. Uh, the promo code is Don13, D-O-N-1-3 on my booking system to find a time that works for you and your child. So wherever it says, like, you know, you've got the promo code, just include Don13 and you'll get that session. You'll get my free book and you also get $250 off my services because like, I, I love working with families that come to me and they're already consuming content where they're wanting to better themselves, better their child. Um, and, and it's just a win-win for the both of us. If I could rewind time back to when I was interviewing out of college, I, I would have loved to have this because it would have fast tracked everything, the modeling, the networking, the accountability. It's almost like having somebody with wisdom who's went through it all come back in time and give that to you for when they wish they would have had it in college. So this is very powerful. I, I, I'm, I want to thank you for giving our audience this opportunity. And last question before we go, because this episode was so good, where can people find you on social media and the web? Yep. So this has been very exciting. And thank you, by the way. And I hopefully your listeners, you know, just got a little bit of jolt of inspiration from hearing my story. Hopefully they were able to resonate with a couple of points that we talked about when it comes to networking, doing things a little bit differently and the impact of what can happen when you just ask for something. And real quick, uh, there was a point that you brought up earlier about, you know, what your life would have been like had you gone through something like this. And this is something that I hear from families often, which uh, makes me really happy that I'm able to impart my wisdom is because so much has changed when it comes to hiring. And I hear from families all the time. It's like, Rashab, I've tried to step up in that role of a career advisor for my child. But I mean, I, I can't tell you the last time that I heard that a computer is looking apart and tearing apart a resume or having to virtually interview. So I thank you. It's almost like, you know, <laughs> the, the age and, and the experience and the relevancy of that becomes an advantage. And, and I'm grateful for that is because I understand their child to the degree that they're, they're unable to just because of the experiences that I've gone through. Um, so if parents want to find me, want to stay in touch, right now I am focused on building the number one community for parents of college students and recent grads looking to help their child land their ideal job or internship. So you will find me if you are a parent listening to this, when you go on Facebook and actually search career planning secrets for parents of college students and recent grads, that is our group. And you may have to click on groups, but it will be the number one search result when you type it and to give a bit of context really quickly. So we're an exclusive group and we recently launched the community for parents of college students and recent grads. And inside the group is where we share like, tons of exact tips, strategies that helped our students receive job offers from companies harder to get into than Harvard. And we even have a free mini course that parents can access to figure out how to create a game plan with their child towards receiving those successful job or internship offers from top rated companies. So that's where you can go ahead and find me. I'm super active in that group. That's career planning secrets for parents of college students and recent graduates. Just type that in on Facebook. And for whatever reason, if you have trouble finding it or it doesn't pop up because Facebook's being a little bit buggy, that's totally okay. I can go ahead and email you the link if you just reach out to me at R-I-S-H-A-V, that's my first name, Rishav, R-I-S-H-A-V, at compoundcareer.com. Awesome. Rishav, I want to thank you for being a guest on the College Prep Confidential Show. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And we will see you next week. That's all for this episode of College Prep Confidential. To discover how to give your student a better future by increasing financial aid, improving test scores, and reducing stress, visit our website at cpcshow.com. That's cpcshow.com.